It's going to be talked for a while. That ain't too bad. This is basically, this is the drivetrain basics. Drivetrain basics. The automatic transmission's hydraulic system uses transmission fluid under pressure directed through what to cause the gears to shift automatically? Huh? Passageways in the valve body. Hey, they're right with. Wes, well, you know that, don't you? What'd you say? I saw that because I had The automatic transmission hydraulic system uses transmission fluid under pressure directed through passages in the valve body to cause the gears to, gears to shift automatically. There was a buddy of mine that was in the military, and you probably think about that, said that he liked to keep a little squirt can with some automatic transmission fluid in it close by to keep his machine gun lubricated because it worked pretty good. Yeah, because it has to protect They mix for the 50 cal uh, a cocktail of one part um, motor oil for the uh, Humvees and two parts of the... Uh, uh, some kind of uh, lubricating uh, stuff they got for, uh, I forget the name of it, um, two parts of the uh, just regular old heavy duty machine gun uh, lubricant. <laughs> well, I guess you can probably buy that at your local machine gun store. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, uh, that was something I did for the 50 cals, so like the 308 machine guns I did. The purpose of the transmission, the purpose of the transmission is to move the vehicular. Yeah. Well, think about what you got there. Put power uh, under the wheels. How many? Uh, let me ask you this. And you think about think about this. How much does a how much does a, a car weigh uh, on the average? About thirty one hundred pounds. Thirty one hundred pounds, more or less. Yeah. All right. So, how many horsepower has your engine got? About two hundred. How much torque? About ninety. Yeah. yeah, something like that. The engine without the transmission, the drivetrain is not going to move the car very well, is it? Yeah. No. Because I mean, you gotta, you gotta have. Well, even if you hook this straight to the wheel, like on a go kart, you know, think about a go kart. A go kart. What, how does a go kart work? I mean, you got a pulley, and you got another pulley that's hooked to your wheels. But up. even on a go kart, you got transmission, more or less. Yeah, it'll get up to speed quick, but it'll lose. It, it, it won't go past certain speed, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what happens is, it's got well, I was talking about there. You like on the go karts, you've got a centrifugal clutch. Yeah. And the one, this one clutch is spring loose, got two pulleys like this, and a, ver a continuous variable transmission is working its way on. Like the 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 yeah. Except they got a big metal uh, link chain in there. But anyway, the front pulley, when it goes out and the back pulley goes in, you know, you've actually got what? You got if you got a little pulley in the front coming off the engine, and a big pulley on the wheels. What do you have? Gear reduction. You got gear reduction. That's your low speed. But as you drive, and the pulleys in the front on the engine go together and it rides that pulley out, the ones in the back go in and you wind up with a little pulley on the back and a big pulley on the front. So it's continuous variable transmission which you got on a go-kart. Now a mini bike, the one of the mini bikes I was always used to, now I don't know how they're built today, them silly little mini bikes on a little frame, of, they have a silly little gear about this big, just like a mini bike chain, like a bicycle chain sort of, a little smaller. And then they have a big gear on the back because they didn't want you going too fast. You know, they had no gear reduction except for between the gear and the chain and all that stuff. But anyway, that's what the transmission is designed to do, is to transmit the power produced by the engine to the rest of the drivetrain that consists of drive shafts and axle assemblies. Now, I talked about this before. If you're going to figure your gear ratio, what do you do? You've got to count how many times it takes the input shaft to go over mm -hmm. it. you got to multiply. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember that? You multiply all the way back. Like in, in first gear, what is your gear ratio usually? Three turns of the engine, three or four turns of the engine, and one turn of the drive shaft, right? Yeah. Okay, as you go up and you get to like third gear, it's one turn of the engine and one turn of the drive shaft. Okay, and then when you get into an overdrive situation, the engine's turning slower than the drive shaft. All right. So if I've got a two to one ratio, you know, like in third gear or whatever, or I mean second gear, and my uh, differential back here, it's got 331. That's 3.31 turns of the drive shaft to one turn of the wheels. Right. Basically, you're going to multiply that all the way back, and that's going to give you your gear ratio of the whole drivetrain in a given year. And so on and so forth. But that's how that. That's not anything that's all that big of a deal unless you're a real gearhead and you're trying to put all this stuff together. You know. But uh, anyway, I was just I didn't charge you anything for that. Okay. <laughs> The blank allows each drive wheel to rotate with the same amount of power, but at different speeds when necessary. Differential. Differential. I had a little differential over there that I like to show. Some 
Yeah, we're that silly little thing. You see it? That little gearbox that I had? It's over here. Here it is. This is differential. I have a little small Japanese car. Oh. All right, your CV axles click into these gears right here. These gears on the side. You see how when I turn those, how they do? If you want them, they got positive traction. Yeah. Well, whenever you have positive traction, like legitimate positive traction that's not welded in a police car, you have behind these gears here, you've got some clutches. Between this gear and here, it's got clutches. Because whenever the, the ring gear is actually mounted to this thing right here, this whole thing's turning. Now, I've got a video I took of that with that, diff or that rear end off of that, that cover off of that uh, one vehicle. It may have been semester before last. And this whole thing's I'll turning. Explore. These gears are looking just like this. None of these gears are actually reacting against each other unless you start going around a curve. If you're making a smaller turn with the inside wheel and a longer turn with the outside wheel, a bigger circle, these gears begin to work. Now, what is the problem with, and you've seen uh, how on some of these little Jap cars, you've got these little differentials like this. If you take the donut tire and you put it on one side of the front, yeah, these gears are just really going to town because you've got a donut on one side and the big tire on the other side. They're just really working their fannies off. See, these, they call these spider gears. That's what people like to call them. But, but this is the differential right here. When you hear the word differential, you know, whenever the, the actual transmission drives the gear that's hooked to this, and this goes out to your wheels. That's basically what that is. And we're going to be tearing some rear ends apart and putting it together. I'm going to show you some special tools and all that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, that's pretty cool stuff right there. I like that one because it's easy for me to hold it. It's not like holding the great big one I got out here. I pretty big. Yeah. Same thing with the 19. Oh, we built a rear end for you. Is that rear end still doing okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had him sitting in. Uh, he learned something about that right there on the spot, didn't he? Set the pinion down and everything. He is. Oh, uh, but, uh, the one I'm bringing tomorrow is going to be a complete limited slip. Maybe talking about with them. Yeah, Coffee. it's got springs. But well, it's got little clutches in between those axle gears and the uh, and this differential housing. And there's a spring, a big S-shaped sheet metal spring that goes in there that pushes them out usually. But there's other ways to do it too. Here, this is what weird about this. Let me tell you a little something right quick while I'm thinking about it. These gears right here for a Ford, like if they, you get all, if they get all tore up, a lot of times in a rear end, if a rear end is making a racket, going chunk, chunk, chunk. If you pull the cover off, you're going to see that these gears here are all chewed up. You can replace these gears, just these little gears in here. On a Ford, like a 97 model F-150, they cost about $65. A piece? No, for the whole set. Oh, that ain't bad. I know, but on a Chevrolet, they're 500 bucks. Wow. Same cool. doggone gears. Wow. I mean, that, I don't know. I don't have any idea why they're so high That's on a GM, but on a Ford they're 65 bucks. And if you hold them in your hands, you can't look at them and tell any different. It's the craziest Jesus. thing I've ever seen. We actually, I mean, you may go buy aftermarket gears, but we bought some. We bought a set of gears in the box from Ford for 65 bucks for a. It was in a positive traction rear end in a pickup truck. And put them in here one time. Put them in a Chevrolet. No, it won't fit in Chevrolet. Why won't they fit? <laughs> well, different rear end manufacturer. Ford makes their own rear ends typically. And, uh, you know, Chevrolet is, you know, different. Uh, typically, the Chrysler stuff, would the rear end would be made by Daner, Dana, Spicer. Not Daner, Dana. Dana Spicer rear ends. Is that, that. And then the Ford made their own. And, uh, and I could, you know, I got some stories to tell about that. And then, uh, you know, the General Motors, they make their own rear ends too. But what happened with Dana, though, in the uh, twilight years of the Jeep Cherokee, uh, the machine tools that they used to grind those gears and everything and, and polish them and all, weren't, I mean, were, I think they were wearing out and getting out of spec, and they were trying to build them as cheap as they could without retooling all their machine stuff, and a lot of the Jeep Cherokees had noisy rear ends in them. Uh, the ring gear and the pinion can look beautiful and still be noisy. I mean, you'll look at those gears, you won't see nothing wrong with them, but when you drive them down the road, yang, 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 they just sing like no telling what. Yeah. And we got another differential to work on in that uh, 2004 uh, model. Hey, Mr. Richard, what about that blade? Don't I need some silicone where the front axle is right there with that piece? Yeah, you probably need to do that while you're there, too. So. <laughs> All right, thanks for reminding me. I would have forgotten that. <laughs> 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 he was so dumb. <laughs> All, right. All right, now let me ask you I this. Just thought about it. The differential is number three. Okay, number four, torque steer. 
occurs on some front wheel drive vehicles because no torque steer is what? When it pulls one side when you try when you go. Yeah, when you're really getting on it and it tries to go off to the side, why does it do that? I don't know. I don't know. I've never figured that out. Anybody know why? Huh? No, that's not a lima thing. That's just, this is a characteristic. They actually some of the cars have been designed in such a way to prevent that. But not a Honda. If you've got a long CV axle on one side and a short CV axle on the other side, the long CV, you know how on your uh, impact wrench, uh, let's say let's say you got a big breaker bar and you got a long extension and you put it on a really tight bolt, you can feel that long extension twisted. Yeah. So All right, so whenever you're taking off on the car, the, the little short axle is not going to twist as much as the long one. This is my take on that. And the short axle is, the, the wheel that's hooked to the short axle is trying to take off and go in front of the other one. But it's a, a turn or two behind it. And what that does is it kind of goes over to the side. One of my buddies had about a 300 horsepower little Honda car, and Thomas got in behind it and was going to drive it. The first time he ever drove a high horsepower front wheel drive car, and he stomped it, you know. And, you know, most of the time when you get sideways in a rear, rear wheel drive car, you let go of the steering wheel and straight back up. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, he let go of the steering wheel. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I was driving a little Ford Escort. It was like an 85 model. The only turbocharged Ford Escort I ever saw that came from the factory that way. It had a turbocharger, turbo it had a turbocharger on it. It was wow. very rare. You know, almost never saw it. I worked on one. And I was, when I, when I opened the hood, I was like, it had a blacked out grill, a little green, green light on the dash, it said boost, it didn't have a boost gauge, it had a little light. And, but I was, I, I opened the hood, and I said, look at that silly little supercharger, or turbocharger, that's a pancake, you know, a little thing, <laughs> no bigger than, you know, a little bitty thing. Now, that's ridiculous, let me put a, something like this on an Escort. And so anyway, I did whatever else I had to do to the car, it wasn't that old, it was nearly, not, you know, probably didn't have 20,000 miles on it. And so, uh, I, I drove, since I was working at the dealership, I drove Escorts all the time anyway. And I pulled out, you know, going to Ross Clark Circle. And, uh, you know, whenever the traffic's coming, you get on out there. And so I hit first. And, and when I hit second, I got into it pretty strong. And that green light came on. And that thing broke rubber. <laughs> <laughs> and it was torque steering, you know, trying to jerk me off the road. I said, whoa. The <laughs> last thing I expected, you know, because you just get used to the way an escort drives, you know. And they're strong enough. But golly, you know, so when that thing, when that boost light came on, it was like, you know, like, Han Solo making a jump to last speed. You know? Whoa, you know? <laughs> there was another. There was another supercharged, I mean, a turbocharged car that I drove. That was a, a Thunderbird, one of them with the four cylinder in it. Before they came out with the Super Coupe, back in the in the eighties, and they had a. It was a twenty three hundred with a little, you know, supercharger on it and all that stuff. And this one kid says, uh, "My throttle sticks wide open." I said, "Yeah, kid, probably got a ticket or something." Now you're trying to, you know. So uh, I get on here, and I drive it, and I drive it, and I drive it, and I drive it, and I never could get it to do anything. Finally, I got out there, kind of on the traffic, I mean, on headed up 231, and I just went ahead and buried the bone, you know, to see if I could get it to stick. Mm -hmm. And when I did, and I don't know why this hadn't happened before, that silly uh, gas pedal stuck under the floor mat, <laughs> and it was all the way to the floor, and I was like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't. <laughs> I mean, it's just tacking up, heading, you know, speedometers talking out, you know. But anyway, that's uh, what that's what torque steer is. We we tell a lot of stories like that. Know. You know, Mark Shipes had that Jeep that wouldn't cancel the cruise, and he got sort of got lulled to sleep because it was canceling the cruise every time we hit the brakes. And on that Jeep, if it gets in its power curve, you ain't got the brakes to stop it. You know, so he's uh, driving this thing around with traffic service. They got bored with it because every time he taps the brake, it drops the cruise out. So finally, he's coming down here to this traffic signal. There's traffic down there, so he he, he taps the brake, and they don't cancel the cruise. So he panicked for a second. He gets on the brake, and the cruise control says, my goodness, we're slowing down. We need more throttle. <laughs> he keeps going down there, and he's got a big, strong leg standing, both feet on the brake, and this thing's doing a burnout out there. <laughs> <laughs> and you think about all the stuff you're going to do, but you yeah, well, they eventually did that, but it scared him, you know. But anyway, that was, <laughs> no, I mean, but it, boy, it'll get your attention when you tip the brake and the thing don't. Well, why does it occur though? Why does torque steer? steer torque right? steer happens just as a natural result of the fact that the drive axles are different lengths. Now you might notice that on some of these vehicles, it's going to have a little sh a shaft coming out, right? That rides in a bearing. You remember seeing something like that? Mm -hmm. And then it comes off at bearing, and the actual ones that have the CV axles on them, those are going to be the same length. And that reduces that torque steer. Yeah, that's steer. like a 3000 GT. They don't, they don't, there's not that much torque steer, steer in them because yep. they've got 
Both CDXs are the identical length. Exactly, and you won't hardly ever see torques here on one like that. It's really a good deal. Okay, let me uh, jump past this. Now you see uh, these uh, this illustration here. Right? You got an illustration of a transmission just like that one we got over there. Oh, yeah. See that? Now, number one is what? You, some of you guys ought to know this now. <laughs> well, That's think about what you're shaft. saying now. Look at number one. Output shaft. No, output shaft because output the back shaft. of that oh. shaft goes to the transmission, right? That's output shaft. That's output shaft. Output shaft, right? All right. All right. And number two. Number two is the input shaft because that's where the clutch is, right? Okay. What's number three? Well, excuse me. Well, no, there's number three is actually uh, illustrating different things. In other words, there's, you see a number three on the left. All of them are pointing in the same kind of part. Yeah, those are synchronizers. The shift fork goes into those and it moves it back and forth to put it in the gears. And finally, number four is what? Counter gear, that's right. Good, good answer. All right, there you go. Y N C H R O N I Z E R. Hold on, Okay, so there you go. Everybody knows uh, one's output, two's input, three's synchronizer, four's counter gear. All automatic transmission vehicles use what to keep the transmission at a normal operating temperature? Transmission. Come on. Yes, yeah, so what about transmission oil coolers? Oh. By the way, that three hundred seventy-eight dollar oil cooler came in for that Saturn, and she also wants the CV axles replaced on it. Good job. Hey, good job for one of these people. Yeah, Brian. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it's really a, a hard, uh, heavy-duty, tough job. I so, uh, it. who is it that doesn't want to do it? Uh, I don't care. I'll do it. But yeah, I gotta I'll do it. Do it. Whoever doesn't want to do it, that's who I'm going to give it to. I don't want to do it, really. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I'll probably let you two guys work on that if you want to, because it's a, it's a, it's a really big, heavy-duty, nice job that, you know, gets your teeth sunk into. You've already pulled up and intake manifold off, so she's still got one. Did you know what she did? Put that thermostat housing back on there and did a good job. She cleaned all them gaskets. She put that thing on there right, put it back together. It's just like it was. Just like it was. Leaking. Leaking in the same spot. But it's cracked. Got too much pressure or something. Or there's a crack. Well, no, she just poured it. As soon as she poured it, she then it started leaking it just like a pencil lid coming out under the thermostat. I told her anybody would have fell in that trap because you'd swear it was a thermostat gasket leaking, you know. But uh, anyway, um, most four wheel drive vehicles are set to run in two wheel drive because why? Most four wheel drive vehicles are set to run in two wheel drive because of what? Because four wheel drive is uh, not as efficient or. That's a good answer. Save the wear and tear and improve gas mileage. But they also have full-time four-wheel drives that have a viscous coupling, you know, that lets it slip, kind of like a fan clutch. But what happens if I put my Bronco out here in four-wheel drive on this hard pavement where the wheels can't slip and I try to drive off on it? It winds up and stops. The drive line winds up. It just stops. You need to have it in the mud and the gravel where the wheels can break loose and spin and all that kind of stuff. If you try to drive it on hard pavement and it's not a full-time four-wheel drive vehicle, you're not going to have good. You're not going to be happy. You know, and you're going to, you can destroy that thing pretty quick. Can't care about. You know these uh, Fuller Road Ranger transmissions and stuff that Eddie and teaches down on here. has got uh, like three shafts in them, I think. And uh, the shafts have to be timed. When you put all that gears back down there, if you don't time them, they'll return about seven rounds and lock up. Mine. So what, what's the answer number seven? The answer number seven is it saves wear and tear and, and, fuel, and it makes it have better fuel economy. To disengage the front drive train from the wheels, a four-wheel drive may have blank or blank. Okay, yes, yeah, number eight. Bones. Manual or automatic Bones. lockout hubs or electric, electric controlled internal axle components. Um, hey, Mr. Richard, which one do you like better? Manual or what? Manual or automatic? I like the automatic one. I don't like to get out and do that. <laughs> you, you can get you can get in a you can get hurt. I knew this one guy that got out to lock the hubs on one. Him and his buddies were driving, and the truck slid off and rolled over on him, killed him oh, while he was locking the hubs. Uh -huh. All he did was got out and lock the hubs, and he was like 18 years old. There wasn't anything wrong. They, they got in a four wheel drive situation. When he got out, you know that he, he was around there, and the truck slid over on him, and that was. That, I'd rather stay in the truck. Manual or automatic lockout loop. Yeah, manual automatic. Is this going to be manual or automatic lockout hubs? Is one answer, and the other one is. Or electronically controlled internal axle components. Oh, yeah, wow, they, that's really long. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, electronically controlled internal action component. Um, the, uh, here's something else that you need to remember too. If you've got automatic locking hubs, like you know, the, and the hubs are doing it out here on the end, like on some of these Fords, when you take it out of four wheel drive, what you're supposed to do is back up the length of the vehicle, like 20 feet or whatever, and that unlocks the hubs. If you take it out of four wheel drive and you don't back up the length of the vehicle, the hubs are staying locked in and you're spinning. Well, I remember when I had that other truck that it said you had to put it in like neutral and you had to put it back and drive to lock it in. Yeah. And to take it out, you had to put it in neutral and press too high and then put it back and drive and locked out. You've got me totally confused now. But oh, I know, but that's how Jim Lay told me to do it. I'm very much so. I used that all the time. All I do for my yeah. Chevrolet is, is it put was it neutral or park and put four high, four low, whatever. Get done using that park or neutral to whatever. You know what Chevrolet told me that you can do? You can take it and lock it in going 30 miles an hour down the road. Yeah, you can. Oh, you you can't put it in low. Oh, I know. But if you're if you're driving along and you're kind of fishtailing around and you need more traction, and you can you can shift on the fly. I mean, that's what it's for. I you know, know that. Yeah, those electronic uh, those electronic ones have got like an air conditioner clutch in there, huh. and when you hit it, it spins the thing up and, and clicks in. Oh, I mean, where it don't mess anything. Up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they've actually got it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 They shift on the fly stuff. Now, not all of them are that. We can't just do it on any. And these are not yeah, the I ones where, like a Bronco way. out here, you grab the knob. You know, <laughs> you don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that on the Bronco. Only on the ones that are electronic shift on the fly are the ones that you just got a button on the dash. You can do yeah. it. You, know, you cannot, though, go into four wheel low unless you stop and put it in neutral. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I was Take yeah. it out four wheel yeah. drive. Four wheel drive vehicles. Let's see. Let's go back here. Uh, let's see. Um, drive line wind up happens when four wheel drive vehicle driven on high traction surfaces with four wheel drive engaged. I just talked about that just a second ago. That's drive line wind up. And number ten, finally, current model vehicles use a blank, which prevents the engine from being started unless the clutch pedal is fully depressed. Yeah. A clutch start switch, neutral safe, neutral start switch. Basically, you have to match the clutch before the car will start. This is crazy, guys. I'm going to tell you a little something that happened when I was in a Volkswagen place. In the early 80s, Volkswagen rabbits did not have a clutch switch. Well, now I'll tell you what happened with that. Uh, whenever I pulled a car in to put it on the lift when I was working at a Volkswagen place in 83, I'd pull the car in, I'd park it on my lift. And see the the big door. Now look at this. The big door was right here, and there was some stalls over here, and there was a stall right over here, and there was some time when I worked in that stall. But on this particular day, I was working in this stall right here, and there was another stall over here, and a parts room was right here, and there's a wall right here, and all that kind of stuff. Well, the guy that was the parts man's brother was playing service manager that day, and he pulled in and parked right here, and a little rabbit. When I pulled the car to put it on the lift, I always put the car in neutral so that when I was setting the lift, I could roll the car by hand to get it just where I wanted it to go, right? Well, he just pulled it in there, and he left that sucker in first gear. Old habits die hard, right? Mine, I always had mine in neutral. Always. But it just so happened that he stopped it because he worked on that lift a lot, and he, we raised it up. And we did something to lower it down, and, he, and I was getting ready to... I was going to get in it and back it out. He goes, you forgot to set the idle speed on it or whatever I had to do. There's some other thing I had to do. Oh, I forgot about that. And I reached in there and started that sucker up. And it was in gear, and it took off and ran into that wall. It broke the wall. It shoved the fire filing cabinets into the office on the other side. The woman in the office was like, whoo! She thought the whole building was coming down. But it, I said, oh, no. So anyway, we we got it back. It was like an 84 model GTI or something. We backed that thing away from the wall. It did not have a scratch on that car. Wow. I couldn't believe that that thing plowed into that con con It was a wall just like this one. It was like these concrete block walls here. And it busted that wall in. I, said, I guess if you went there right now, that wall is still busted in. And that's <laughs> where Wolf Motor Company is, an enterprise. That's where it was. That was, that was where the Wolf Motor Company was. But anyway, the point is... If that car had had a clutch switch, I would have had to get in the car and put my foot on the clutch and start it. Oh, so you did it. I'm, yeah, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't start it. I didn't park the car on the lift, but I still should have checked to make sure it was in neutral. My fault. 
But I never had that problem when I was the one that parked the car because I had a tendency to leave it in neutral. Now, the other end of that thing is I was goofy enough to where I got so used to that that one time uh, I left his pickup in neutral, parked it on a service lot, left it in neutral. Mm. And I don't know what I was thinking about. I guess my head was in the clouds or something. It rolled. And, and it, well, I got out of the truck and I walked all the way across the lot. That's when I was at Bondi's. And I went in there to the parked room and I said, I need to order such and such for this truck. And he says, We need to know some piece of information that was on the truck, but I didn't need to open the truck to get it. I can't remember what it was. Uh, so I walked back out there. And, I, that, and I'm talking about, I was walking like 150, 200 feet. And as I was walking up to that truck, down at the bottom of the hill was the detail shop where all the new cars were sitting. Waiting to be <laughs> and this car, as I, this truck, is like a four, four-door you know, crew cab, like a you know, F-150. As I was walking up to it, I saw it beginning to roll. <laughs> it sat there and didn't move until I was almost to it. What did I do? I didn't even have the key to the doggone thing. I grabbed the mirror. <laughs> help! Somebody come help me! <laughs> I mean, but, I, I mean, but I, if, if, I, if I hadn't had to walk back out there, that thing would have headed off down the hill and plowed into a new Crown Victoria or something. You know? yeah. that's, how, that's how you get fired from a car dealership is doing something stupid like that. But, but, I mean, it's really easy to make a mistake. You know what I'm saying? And most of the time when you've got an instructor... That's in a position I'm in. They won't tell you about the stupid mistakes they made, but that was a stupid mistake, you know. And I, and I learned from that. Hey, that's the only way you learn. Yeah. Well, I didn't hit anything, you know. Uh, by the grace of God, it didn't crash into a car down there and tear it up. But anyway, that finishes up this particular test for today. Hey, Mr. Richie. And, um, what is the purpose of automatic four wheel drive? Like on the Chevrolet, it said like auto four wheel drive. What's the purpose? Okay. Of Whenever you're driving along, like we, some of the Ford Aerostars had that. And they had a little, you couldn't even choose to put it in four-wheel drive. But it's actually got uh, speed sensors on the axles. And if it actually figures out, it's almost like traction control. If it finds out that the wheels are spinning, then it automatically puts it in four-wheel drive for you so that you get more traction. You don't have to do nothing. You just drive it. When it needs four-wheel drive, it selects four-wheel drive. Now, on some of them, they may have it where you can select it if you want to. But on those Aerostars, you could not select four-wheel drive. And most of the people that had that didn't even know they had it. But underneath the seat was a little bitty computer that was not about the size of a pack of cigarettes. And it was taking speed signals from, you know, the front and the back drive shafts and all that. And it was actually watching it all the time. And if it ever saw that the rear wheels were spinning and the front ones were not rolling as fast, it would in a transfer case. It's like a regular four-wheel drive. And it would it would act to put that thing in four wheel on flat. Yeah, so it's pretty much like traction control. And Very right. similar, but it is it, it puts your other axle in, in line, you know, and uh, that kind of stuff. So uh, all wheel drive cars really take curves good too. Like if you yes, they do. Yeah. If you got, <laughs> if you got an all wheel drive car that's you know that's uh, one of these old, you know sports yes. cars that's got all wheel drive, boy, will it ever hurt? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I took a curve like that about 120. Yeah. I had yeah. about 400 horsepower. And it broke loose. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were you were pushing the envelope and all that. Yeah, it was pretty sharp. You went you went to the danger zone. <laughs>